Hi everyone. Sorry about the uh, the delay there. I think uh, I think we had a bit of a hiccup with the uh, system there, but uh, things seem to be working now. So uh, I'm Liam Eagle. I'm the editor here at the Web Host Industry Review, and I'd like to welcome you all to another one of our WER webinars. Uh, I am the uh, or, so today's session is called uh, Proven Innovation in Cloud Information Technology to Reduce Data Center OpEx, and it's going to feature a presentation from Dina Davidson of Dell, uh, Naveen Bora of Intel, and Winston Damarillo of Morph Labs. And I'll let everyone introduce themselves properly in a moment, but before we go any further, I just wanted to take a moment and take care of a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, some of you may have questions, uh, and we're going to save a few minutes at the end of the session for those questions. However, you can feel free to submit them uh, throughout the session. Uh, using the question function in the webinar software. So I'll be keeping an eye on those throughout, and uh, as far as actually putting the questions to our presenters, uh, we're going to leave that until the end. But uh, uh, know that we will address the questions when, you, when they come up. Um, if you do ask a question and it doesn't get answered because we run out of time, or maybe it's a bit too specific or uh, obscure, uh, rest assured that we, we will have a record of all the questions that were asked and who asked them, and uh, somebody will reach out to you via email after the webinar. Or if you have a question you'd rather ask uh, outside of a public forum, uh, you can certainly uh, contact the uh, presenters directly after the fact and reach out to them that way. <coughs> Excuse me. As always, there will be a video archive of the webinar available. Uh, if you want to revisit a slide or part of the presentation or uh, share it with somebody else, uh, it'll be in the archives at theword.com slash webinars as of uh, first thing next week. So it'll be there alongside a lot of our other great past webinars, including uh, a few others in involving Dell. So uh, that's definitely worth a look. Um, Without, uh, without much further ado, I will turn things over to Dina and uh, let her introduce herself and get things started. Dina? Sure. Thanks, Liam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dina Davidson. I'm a product marketing manager on the Power It's Being team at Dell. And for today's webinar, Proven Innovation in Cloud Information Technology to Reduce Data Center OpEx by 40%. As Liam mentioned, we'll have three speakers. So next slide, please. Um, I will be explaining what Power HD is what microservers are, and how Dell's third generation microserver, the T5220, can reduce your operating expenses by 40%. We also have Naveen Bora, a product marketing manager for Intel's microserver products. And he'll be covering the microserver opportunities, uh, usage models and drivers, Intel server technology leadership, um, and then review Intel's microserver CPU roadmap. We're also excited to have Winston Demarillo who is the co-founder and CEO of Morph Labs. Morph Labs is a C5220 microserver customer, so Winston will talk about today's business challenge with the private cloud, the mCloud rack, the fully converged cloud infrastructure, why Dell's microservers make sense, and the benefits of the mCloud rack for your business. Next slide, please. So what is PowerHC? Five years ago, the Data Center Solutions Group, also known as DCS, was created to work with the world's largest customers in the Web 2.0 cloud hosting and HTC space. They built custom servers that were optimized for the scale-out environment. Three years later, in, in March 2010, Dell introduced PowerHD, which makes some of those customized servers more broadly available. And since then, we've introduced nine innovative products, one of which we'll talk specifically about today. Next slide, please. What's special about PowerHD innovation? All our products have streamlined features, so you only get and pay for what you need. Um, general purpose servers aren't always the best fit for scale-out environments, whereas PowerHD servers were designed specifically for those types of environments. PowerHD is also designed with redundancy predominantly up to the software layer. It doesn't have extensive systems management or broad enterprise storage capabilities. Um, the systems management it does have on each product is built upon industry standards. But most importantly, PowerHD customers can leverage the same expertise as the world's largest search engine, Web 2.0, and cloud computing companies such as Microsoft, Facebook, and eBay. Next slide, please. So where did the concept of microservers come from? We've all heard of Moore's Law, which effectively states that processor speeds or overall processing power will double every two years. And for many applications, Moore's Law consistently enables significant improvement in performance, especially for applications such as high-performance clusters, online transaction uh, processing, and virtualization. However, there are other application requirements that have not scaled with the available performance. And those applications are such as LAMP stacks, um, web servers, file and print servers, 
Um, so obviously they don't need the same type of hardware requirements as you would need with a high performance cluster, for example. So before microservers, you either had to over provision, so you spend more on hard hardware that isn't tailored to your specific application, or revert to an N minus one generation hardware, which isn't ideal in either case. The next slide, please. Further expanding on the what is a microserver, IDC and the SSI Forum, which if you aren't familiar with the SSI Forum, is a server industry group that drives server infrastructure standards and enables new markets. Both IDC and the SSI Forum define microservers as scale-out, single-socket, entry-level servers that have lower power consumption, improved density, and um, have better efficiencies for resource sharing. And specifically, they're for applications, as I mentioned before, for entry-level dedicated hosting, fixed-function web um, servers, such as static web page serving, or cost-effective web services. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of the PowerHD products are leveraged from the, the data center solutions group, um, groups work with customized um, servers for specific large customers. And that's also how the microservice came to be in our, in, in, within Dell. In working with a large hosting customer in France, um, some of their challenges were this, that they required dedicated and virtualized servers. They're racked with power constraints to obviously to the sub three kilowatt um, range. There were space constrained data centers. Obviously they wanted to get more of the data center space. Um, the workloads weren't very complicated. Uh, compute intensive or taxing. It was more like a LAMP um, application. And they were facing increasing costs with the same budget. So Dell created microservers that since then have evolved into its third generation with advantages such as four times the density of traditional 1U servers. You get 12 servers in a 3U versus 12 1U servers. 75% less to cool than traditional 1U servers uh, due to the reduced footprint. 150% more dense than HP half high blade. And the shared infrastructure design, which I'll expand upon later, uh, consumes less floor, space, power, and cooling. And also features 92% efficient power supplies. Next slide, please. So here are the details of the third generation microserver called the PowerHD 5220, which includes two form factor options where you can get either eight, which is the top right picture um, form factor sled or the 12 sled form factor which is the thinner um, option you see at the bottom right. Um, so you get they're all single socket servers all based on Intel's um, recently announced E3 1200 V2 processor series so they have the, obviously the horsepower of the Xeon processors. You get four gen slots they're all used gems with ECC. You get the option of either having two three and a half inch hard drives or um, four two and a half inch hard drives depending on your storage needs. Um, you get the onboard dual port um, gig mix. There is an option with the eight sled form factor where there is a an added mezzanine card. And those options today are um, an LSI 2008 SAS controller if you want SAS or RAID. Um, an extra uh, dual one gig e port or we also recently also um, added the dual 10 gig e option as well. Um, all of them have an integrated SD um, card reader for, you know, if you want to install hypervisors. Um, and they all come with the N plus 1 1400 watt power supplies, and then you get your IPMI 2.0 management for systems and IKVM and fixed support. They're all individually serviceable nodes, so one go, if we have to service one node, it doesn't affect the others. And they're all cold aisle serviceable, so you never have to go in the hot aisle, uh, which also benefits to you and your data center environment as well. Next slide, please. So because of the shared infrastructure design, um, which means that the individual server share the same cooling, power, and mechanicals, you get to see the great benefit here. So with cooling specifically, if you took um, 12 one U one socket servers, there are you would there would be 48 fans. With our C5220 with the shared infrastructure design, there are actually only eight fans to cool all uh, 12 servers. So that's 160 amount of fans. Power-wise, you're also using, um, since you're all sharing the same resources, um, cooling and power-wise, there is 40% less power. 
success, that's where you get the 40% less in operating expenses. It's directly related to your um, operating expenses in terms of cooling um, and, and less power consumption. And then the biggest benefit, obviously, is density. Since they're sharing the same 3U um, chassis, you can fit 12 individual one socket servers all in a 3U footprint. So next slide, please. With all those great benefits, um, we actually have measured data from our performance analysis lab. And one of the things that we found, um, given a, a 13 kilowatt rack, for example, we took a 48U rack, um, we could fit 3.65 times more servers in a rack um, versus a competitive one use system. And that meant, for example, um, we, we went to a well-known hosting customer's website, took some pricing from there, and that would translate to them because they could fit 122 more servers per rack that they could potentially earn $1.6 million more in revenue, obviously making them a lot more money and getting a lot more out of their data center space. While also at the same time, next slide please, reducing your OPEX by 40%. Um, so here you can see on the left-hand side, there's you know, 144 servers and then there's also 168 servers. Um, and then comparing the microservers in C5220 compared to a two-socket server in, this, in a one-use space. We took the energy cost difference over that, and that was depending per server, it's $210 that you save every three years. For 144 servers, you save 30432 or even as, obviously, as you scale up, the number's going to go up as well. But that's your, you are saving yourself and reducing your OPEX by 40%, which is huge for you and your business. And now we'll have Naveen from Intel. The next slide. Thanks, Dinia. Uh, so you got a good uh, view or understanding of uh, you know Dell's C5520 or C5220 platform. Uh, so let's back up a little bit and you know talk about some of the usage models and applications that are suited for microservers. And uh, I'll also talk about some of the key drivers that are driving interest in this uh, new category of servers. Um, so the microserver opportunity uh, can be best represented, you know, in a simple and in a simplistic way with the help of a 3D workload model. You know, this model is defined by three axes, as you can see on your screen. You know, the, there's a axis called scales with core count pointing to your left, pointing to the left, and uh, axis called scales with physical nodes and uh, axis pointing upwards. So the applications that reside along uh, the axis called scales with core count you know, those workloads increasingly benefit from, you know, more and more cores uh, being added to an individual server. Um, these workloads are highly parallelized workloads, uh, which means that, you know, the software can take advantage of many cores or threads a platform can offer. Uh, these workloads also share common I.O., you know, system memory and storage, and often these workloads, uh, you know, tend to take advantage of the large coherent uh, mem memory space that the system has to offer. Uh, now the workloads uh, on the axis that reside along with, the, that reside on uh, scale with physical nodes, uh, you know, these workloads are also highly parallelized. Uh, the difference uh, being that, you know, they tend to be, uh, they tend to scale better with uh, more physical servers. Uh, with, uh, with, you know, with the physical servers being interconnected and working on some portion of the workload. So servers along this axis tend to have, you know, lower memory requirement, lower I.O. and storage requirements per server, uh, but given that there are lots of these servers in a, in a, in a chassis or in an in infrastructure, you need sufficient net networking to ensure that, you know, the workloads run well across, you know, multiple nodes. Uh, now the axis that is pointing upwards, um, uh, labeled scale with brawny cores. Uh, brawny core is a term that you know Google coined uh, for the cores that are uh, you know better or bigger cores. So the workloads along this axis tend to scale uh, better with you know uh, the cores that have more capabilities. So as you move upward along this axis, uh, you are adding performance and you know features. Uh, to in individual cores in the server, particularly in the areas of, you know, frequency, cache, uh, you know, the memory size, bandwidth, and the applications that scale better with individually high performance cores tend to be single threaded or have limited parallelization built into them. So um, uh, on the next slide, you know, we'll talk about 
you know, some of the usages or workloads that are suited for microservers uh, as we map, you know, the server workloads in the 3D space. So what you see on this chart uh, is that, you know, the vast majority of server workloads fit within the, the big box that you see right in the middle. It's called, you know, standard workloads cube. These workloads have a wide range of needs. Uh, you know, ranging from high performance cores to low performance, from uh, low scalability to high scalability. Uh, but the key attribute is that these uh, needs are typically met by uh, a same kind of server, like a two socket server, you know, uh, with different platform or processor configurations. And uh, the locations of the workloads uh, represented by the small dots, you know, that's dependent on the characteristics of the workloads that tend to vary uh, you know, quite a bit. So, for example, uh, high-frequency financial applications, uh, you know, which are uh, more single-threaded, you know, require extremely high CPU frequency. So, they are, are kind of mapped towards the, the top right portion of the cube. Whereas, if you take a, a, a scale-out workload, uh, for example, like a Hadoop workload, uh, that typically doesn't uh, require uh, as much CPU frequency, uh, but it can leverage more cores. Uh, and more physical servers, so it's uh, mapped to you know further left of the, the the standard workloads queue. At the bottom right, you'll notice that there is a region called uh, low and scale out region. Uh, the applications in this space uh, don't need high performance processors, uh, nor do the workloads scale best by you know adding more cores. Uh, instead, they scale scale well by adding you know lightweight uh, servers. So examples of the workloads in, in this area are, you know, ultra low end web servers, you know, basic dedicated hosting, uh, you know, content delivery. Uh, neither of these applications require powerful processors, you know, uh, and they scale best by adding more uh, microservers. So next I'll talk about, you know, uh, which Intel products best meet the needs for these workloads. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what you see is in this uh, on on your screen is that uh, the workload model illustrates where Intel processors and platforms are positioned. Uh, what is most important to note here is that you know all these uh, different regions can be addressed with Intel architecture, uh, and the same software can run across uh, uh, different regions. Uh, most of the server applications that I showed you on the previous uh, chart, you know. Uh, Intel Xeon E5 series processors, which are represented in the green color, uh, is the sweet spot which offers the largest range of efficient performance platforms for the different workload needs. Um, the Xeon E5 series is primarily, primarily a two-socket server, as you know, and uh, it represents the largest volume for Intel servers. Now, uh, in today's context, you know, the, the region on the right side, which is represented in yellow and red, uh, that's the area where you know Xeon E3 processors, uh, which are basically single socket servers, serve the needs for most of the microserver workloads. And for some applications uh, that require low processing power and you know tend to be more I/O bound or I/O intensive, uh, we have Atom as an option. So on the next slide, um, I'll talk about you know some of the key purchase drivers uh, that are being uh, factored in for this uh, new class of servers. Uh, the drivers that you see on the on the screen are not necessarily in the priority order and uh, are all important, you know, depending on your usage model of workloads. And these are very all applicable also to the hosting space, you know. So starting with, you know, uh, performance per watt per dollar, uh, for highly parallelized or distributed workload that we talked about, uh, this happens to be the most important consideration, you know, and even in the hosting space uh, where OPEX is, is important, as Dina mentioned. As you scale, you want to make sure that you're op optimizing for power, cost, and performance. You don't want a platform that is oversized or un undersized for these uh, key vectors. Uh, the second one is um, um, uh, acquisition cost, which also happens to be very important for uh, hosters. Um, um, again, where performance per node or service, uh, uh, performance per node or server is less important, 
uh, you know, you want to make sure that your acquisition cost is pretty low, uh, which means you can, you know, recuperate your uh, uh, your return on investment. And uh, for applications that are lightweight and tend to do a lot of uh, I/O operations, like you know, content delivery, right sizing the platform also becomes a very important consideration. And lastly, uh, there are some uses, usages again, hosting falls in that space uh, that might require very high node density. Uh, because you know you want to support or host as many users as you want uh, as, as you can in a given footprint. So next, uh, I'll uh, talk about you know microservers. Uh, Dini already touched about touched on how we define microservers. So just as there are a wide range of uh, server usage models and workloads. You know, we have seen uh, a continual innovation in the system architecture as well to meet various design points and efficiency goals. Um, you know, for example, enterprise has benefited from innovation in the plate architecture, uh, particularly over the past decade, you know, driving improved performance density and, you know, lowering the manage manageability costs. Um, now, there are a new class of server innovations. Uh, uh, which we call density optimized servers, which have higher density goals versus uh, traditional venue racks and blades, as Dinia showed earlier on. Uh, the density optimized category includes half width uh, racks, half width blades, and we are seeing emergence of microservers. Uh, so the microservers are basically a new option for achieving higher density and efficiency. And the way we define microserver is, you know, a collection of many small socket servers, single socket servers that share. Um, Common resources such as you know chassis, uh, the cooling infrastructure, and the and switching. And by deploying a microserver, you know customer can see uh, up to four x density versus traditional one u servers with far fewer fans, power supplies, and cables. And another benefit with microservers is you know the ability to support wide range of you know Intel processors, you know depending on your workload needs. So next, um, I'll talk about you know what Intel is doing in this space. So we have a world-class microserver roadmap, and I'll share that uh, with you in a bit, that offers a full range of solution, you know, spanning from uh, low power, low cost to high performance, you know, with our Atom to uh, Atom processors and Xeon processors, all offering consistent service, uh, server class features. This is something that customers um, require, you know, like 64-bit instruction set support that enables higher memory capacity, support for ECC memory and support for virtualization for uh, you know workload migration and management in this space and this is all enabled by you know the state of the art process technology that Intel has and you know the huge resources we put into you know validating these solutions another benefit from you know uh, uh, that we derive from our products is you know the strong strong x86 software ecosystem that we have where we have multiple or millions of applications and you know developers working on the software stacks you know that enables application scalability across the multiple products that we have you know uh, with Atom at the bottom and going all the way up to Xeon and you don't really need to modify or port your software stack you know from one product to another product or from gen to gen and uh, we also have a huge focus on you know supporting the software enabling the drivers and the firmwares uh, making sure that we are optimizing and benchmarking on the workloads uh, that are suited for the server space and the workloads that are evolving specifically for microservers. Uh, and at the same time, we are driving uh, standards in the industry for microservers. Uh, Dinia mentioned about SSI. That's an industry standard that we are driving in the microserver space you know, to converge industry on a common form factor and also reduce R&D and accelerate time to market for our customers. On the next slide, um, I'll show you what our roadmap looks like. You know, in 2009, you know, if we talked about low power, you know, Xeon was the lowest uh, power Xeon, lowest powered Xeon that we offered was uh, in the range of 60 to uh, 65 to 30 watts range. Uh, as you can see, you know, last year we. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we added a 15 watt processor on our roadmap so you can see gen to gen we have been driving you know significant improvements in, uh, in, in, in power consumption you know lowering it uh, uh, every generation and also at the same time delivering significant improvements in performance per watt. Uh, this year we lo launched 22 nanometer uh, 
10 to 22 nanometer based IV bridge processors uh, that go all the way down to uh, 17 watts. Uh, uh, this needs to be corrected. Sorry, this is uh, the, the lowest power Xeon is 17 watts, not uh, 20 watts as shown. Uh, and for for the designs that care about lowest uh, power and highest density, we will be launching an atom based product uh, at the end of this year. So now on to uh, Winston, who will uh, provide his perspective on microservers. Great. Thank you, guys. And I'm excited to talk about this part, because this is where I get to say how we've taken the, the great technology that Intel has built in microprocessor and then productized into the microservers at uh, by Dell, and then transforming that and applying that into an industry which uh, we think is lap rapidly growing and can benefit greatly from these technologies. So I want to start off with um, uh, an image of a private cloud. And I'm going to constrain all my discussions into the private cloud. And I'm using this first slide to actually provide a premise of where we're coming from. So when we talk about savings, it's savings from this current infrastructure. So what you're looking at here is a typical private cloud implementation. Uh, it is what's most represented today in the industry. It's mo most widely deployed private clouds look like this. Tends to start with plate servers at the bottom uh, that tend to then consolidate the execution of virtual machines into storage area networks connected via fiber or complex LAN and then um, would share data perspective on a more expensive storage platform on the top. So uh, when we start talking about the benefits of hyperscale and micro, micro cloud to begin with, keep this picture in mind, right, because this is what we're disrupting from an architecture standpoint as we move on to talk about the, the following slides. So if we if we take this perspective and move on to the next slide, which talks about the market, what's really interesting in cloud is that um, on the next slide here, we're going to start talking about uh, where the market is at the moment. So from an enterprise use perspective, uh, public cloud has become a well understood solution uh, for certain workloads. And as private cloud implementers have, have, have consumed public cloud, they're beginning to see benefits of implementing private cloud. So the trend is uh, hitting a peak from a public cloud standpoint and moving into private cloud. And the reasons for that is as, as we are becoming more familiar with the use and construct of cloud and as more of innovation coming from the, on the hardware side in hyperscale and microprocessor, it's actually become cheaper to implement your private cloud for the base load and only extend out to the public cloud when you need spiky load. So that, that pattern is now hit its uh, transition point and it's beginning to move forward. In fact, this is looking to be 15 billion in 2015 and increasing larger. So what are we doing uh, in terms of innovation in the private cloud space so that it becomes significantly more accessible to the market? So if we move on to the next slide, an example of a product that can implement this is a uh, technology that we, we built here at Morph Labs. So at Morph, uh, we have a product called the mCloud Rack. And the mCloud Rack uh, on slide 23 is a fully converged cloud infrastructure constructed using the Dell C5220 platform as our workhorse compute. Uh, what we've done with this, and in conjunction with the engineers at Dell, is to take in the, the C5220 building block put it in a rack uh, and construct a, a private cloud um, architecture that can provide the least amount of uh, power consumed in the highest density compute at the lowest footprint of storage area network. So this particular example, for instance, takes that initial drawing of what the private cloud looks like today and shrink that down in the order of 8 to 1. And that's that's something that is enabled because of, of hyperscale infrastructure. So uh, other new things that have been introduced to a typical private cloud is the introduction of SSD, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The shrinking of the storage area network into modular storage node. The introduction of a familiar ZFS file system that's, that's more compatible to the enterprise. Um, and the use, the extensive use of open source technology like KVM as a hypervisor, like Ubuntu as an operating system, like OpenStack as an orchestration platform, which really gives the end user the ability to mix and match best of breed technologies and mix and match uh, virtualization capability itself. So 
how does this actually get implemented and how do the building block transition uh, impact the architecture of, of the cloud? So if you, if you move on to the next slide here, um, what we have done um, with the use uh, and the leverage that the C5220 has provided is the elimination of the use of storage area network for running VMs. So starting with a 5220 slate, we've uh, made and taken uh, the use of externalized IOPS or input-output operations from a high-density SAN, which is very expensive, and put it right on the sled itself. And we're able to do that because we've replaced the hard drives that Dina was showing up earlier with SSDs. And SSDs provide to us about 80,000 IOPS per sled. So I now have a compute budget of 10,000 IOPS uh, per sled uh, within the 5220 microarchitecture. And with that, uh, not only do I provide a significant reduction of OPEX by reducing the need for SAN and complex fiber networking, I've also increased the IOPS budget to about 10,000 IOPS per virtual machine in this, in this environment. Um, again, by, sh by, uh, by removing the intermediary uh, storage area network for running VMs, uh, we've also, are, you know, we're introduced with the capability of, of modular storage. And what modular storage has done for us is to actually substantially reduce the footprint of the data store, primarily limiting it to the most important data storage platforms, and then front-ending that, that trunk data uh, with uh, SSDs both in the write and the read catch perspective. So really taking the whole idea of, of what used to be a complex private cloud down to a modular and distributed architecture. And finally, what's, what's added to this environment uh, with the use of the micro um, uh, server architecture is the use of smart switching. And this is going to manifest itself in the business models that then uh, uh, people are used in delivering a differentiated hosted private cloud offering uh, that we're going to see on the, on the next slide. So cloud is, is a fairly um, complex infrastructure, if you think about it from a provider standpoint. Uh, clouds um, you know, have evolved from typical virtualization, where you have a machine that is, has been virtualized, so you can divide and, and share the capacity of the machine into multiple applications. If you take that to the next stage, uh, what you, what's overlaid in virtualization to make it cloud are things like operational uh, support portals, so hardware systems management, um, cloud environment management, application performance management, and the services that overlay on top of that, like DNS services, load balancer, and firewall. So all of these must be present on top of virtualization uh, to call an infrastructure a cloud or an infrastructure as a service platform. Um, beyond that, uh, technologies that make the operations of the cloud uh, efficient from a system admin standpoint needs to be there. So that's what's going. Uh, that's what's here on your left of this particular slide. And really, to re increase the benefit of a cloud to the user base, uh, it's also been made very simple to use from developers. So things like self-provisioning, application management, workload management, server templates, team management systems. Um, that's, that's overlaid in, into the cloud. So this is the entirety of what is uh, going to make up what's called the real cloud. And what's exciting about um, uh, the introduction of hyperscale and microarchitecture in the C5220 specifically is I can, sh I can fit all these functionalities in one sled within that microserver. And if uh, I needed redundancy, I can just duplicate it. And if I needed to scale, I could just multiply the number of, of sleds, all the while making that um, a, a scenario where the client will have full control and ownership over its machines. So if you look at it, uh, if you look at the next slide down here, um, if the, the micro server architecture really enables this unique function. And uh, as people's use on public cloud or hosted cloud become mature, um, the requirement and the need for the cloud ar architecture to be segregated uh, has become greater. And segregation or share nothing architecture is really a requirement um, rooted on three things. The first thing that people look for is data privacy. Uh, when I'm using a service provider, it would be ideal if I'm not sharing my compute and storage. So I want isolation for that. 
Uh, the second piece that people are looking for when they want to isolate the environment is they don't they want to have quality of service, right? Uh, a lot of the cloud infrastructure today that are public really have variable performance, and what's important to a, a, a more sophisticated users is to make sure that um, the consumption of resources are isolated, and that's what QoS can do to you. And then finally, security. Uh, a lot of people are worried about uh, intermingling of um, uh, security risk and uh, the resulting uh, attacks that could happen in environments. Uh, and uh, what's being added now to requirement from a service provider is, is that security isolation capability. So with the microcloud and with the advent of the 5220, what we have done and have deployed this across several data center customers is to deliver a rack where we have very granular um, uh, separation of capability among the compute sleds itself uh, that has shared uh, resources in cooling, power, and chassis to make it very efficient from a power consumption standpoint and chassis footprint standpoint, but then continue to provide um, sleds up to 12 on a 3U platform of unique compute resources. Uh, and then what our customers have done with this uh, when they transpose this architecture into a service is to create instantly constructed virtual private clouds. And this brings about not just savings in cost because it consumes a lot less power, it provides for an opportunity for service provider to make more money by offering differentiated service beyond just public cloud but into hosted private cloud. And by comparison, that's a service that if uh, you compare pricing to an Amazon, they charge about $10 per hour. Uh, so it, it really provides not just savings but new revenue opportunities for service providers that are offering hosted private cloud uh, in a hosted private cloud uh, environment. Um, it's worked extremely well. So if you look at uh, the next slide here, it, it's worked extremely well in, in three very distinct workloads that we've seen in the market. Um, most private clouds today are implemented starting with things like enterprise dev and test environments where there are strong IP constraints, where infrastructure performance is directly correlated to developer productivity, allows them rapid time to market and delivery. Um, private cloud environments have worked extremely well with HPC environment, uh, where programmatic execution of queued workload is extremely important, uh, where they need high IOPS uh, for 3D and image processing, where multi multiple volume connection uh, that can be connected and disconnected in real time is, is requirement. And finally, it's, you know, it's been used extensively in web-facing applications where compliance requires uh, that a hosted cloud is still private and that its resources are, are never shared across the multiple tenants within a service provider, and, and that requirement is, is a necessity. And that, that's very common to healthcare, financial services, and media. Uh, still, providing rapid scaling. So what's great about service providers that are able to offer uh, hosted private cloud with dynamic scaling brought about by the C5220 is they can offer this, right? I, they can offer isolation and at the same time rapid scaling by just adding sleds as needed. And the atomicity of the sleds of 5220 allows them to do that. And, and all of this can be overlaid with the DevOps automation. And finally, on my last slide here, uh, it's really just talking about uh, what we have learned from uh, modern architecture, and we're looking forward to further innovation that Dell and, and Intel is, is bringing out to the market, that you know today a complete ready-to-use modern architecture uh, will save money. So the, the Moore's Law, uh, both in the microprocessor standpoint and the rapid, rapid execution of Dell and putting that into hyperscale architecture, will save money. It eliminates SAN, it, it improves performance, and it saves power. Um, you know, when you think about the consumer base, uh, there's a big think differently movement going on, um, you know, leveraging the benefits of cloud computing in public cloud, but really requiring more of a shared nothing infrastructure. Uh, we've also seen that, that in most cases, people have tended to build or to buy rather than build um, uh, architecture, and that complexity uh, in buying a pre-built platform has, has become significantly less as uh, Dell has, has made it easy for uh, developers like Morph Labs to really deliver um, converged implementations out there. Finally, open standards. Um, what's great about what Amazon has brought to market is the clear understanding of uh, how cloud should operate and APIs that correspond to that. 
a DL programmatic infrastructure request is here today, and we can we can get that. And finally, think hybrid. Most uh, for most part, implementations in cloud today are hybrid. And when you think about hybrid, uh, the element that uh, requires a little bit more thought is the one that is the private part of the hybrid. And the good news there is that the architecture to deliver that today has not only become very easy to consume, but it's exceeding in its innovation than the public cloud, cloud providers. And so you know, expect a lot of savings as people start constructing their own private cloud. That's all I have, and thank you very much. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Awesome. Thank you so much, Winston. It's always great to hear how Dell products have made a difference for our customers' uh, businesses. So to summarize, um, we've talked about from Dell, how so Dell has made their customers' difference in some of the world's largest cloud computing companies more widely available to use with power at sea. And we shared the latest in microserver design um, now in our third generation with the power at sea 5220. Um, Nor uh, Naveen from Intel um, talked to you about how we enabled you with the microserver opportunities that exist for you today by demonstrating the usage models for microservers and the drivers for them. Uh, um, he also talked about and highlighted um, Intel's technology leadership in this space and then shared the Intel innovation in microserver uh, CPU roadmap to give you strategic directions for your company. And then Winston from Morris Labs um, discussed business challenges um, solved with private cloud. Um, and he also outlined proven solutions with their mCloud rack and the power of C5220 and highlighted the benefits of the mCloud rack for your business. Thank you so much for your time today. And I believe the next is if there's anybody has any questions for us. So uh, I would like to, <clears throat> thanks guys, I'd like to, uh, you know, invite the, the attendees who are here to, uh, again, to submit any questions they may have through the uh, question panel in the webinar software. Uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> uh, I do have a few questions I'd like to uh, put to you guys. Uh, let me start uh, uh, for, for Dina. I have, I have a couple, and I, I think there probably might be insight from all the panelists, but I think I direct a, a couple of these questions to you, which is, I guess, is there, um, I mean, and let's assume that I'm talking about web hosting environments, obviously, uh, in general. Uh, is, is there a, a sort of a accepted path? I know that the, a lot of the microserver technology that you guys are introducing is fairly new. Uh, is there an sort of accepted path for migrating existing workloads onto a denser architecture? Or, or have you seen customers doing that as space becomes tight? Or is, is most of the microserver implementation happening right now sort of for new New, uh, well, in the case of hosting customers, new business or new, new workloads. I mean, have you seen a, a path for migrating older stuff? Right. So there, there is a combination of, of of things. The one is there are customers who are migrating, and um, two, there are customers who who are just learning about microservers and what they can do, and they are curious about it. So we worked a lot with them in trying to understand what their applications are and if they are a good fit for microservers, because obviously microservers aren't for everybody. Um, and second, there isn't obviously a difference between migrating what they have today in terms of if they do have, you know, obviously their x86 architecture processors, they shouldn't have any trouble migrating to the to our x86 um, based solution as well. Um, so it, it is a, it is a mixture of of customers who are uh, migrating. Um, coming down from like uh, systems that they've had for three or four years and they think this is an exciting new product and it will give them a lot more um, a lot more out of their data center space. We, we've actually had a customer who was able to reduce their rack footprint from eight to one. So they were really excited about that. And, and there's just other customers who as they're developing new applications for their environments, they are looking to microservers to see if that is a good fit for them and we are working closely with them on those on those applications. Okay, so I know you, you discussed a lot of the density benefits and the power consumption benefits of microservers and how you, and, and, and like you said, the, 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 the key benefit being you can fit, I think you said four times as many servers into a rack, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of an overall data center architecture standpoint, I mean, is there uh, uh, power infrastructure re-engineering that needs to take place or is it, is it sort of, uh, does it tend to fit within the existing infrastructure uh, of most of these situations? 
It tends to fit um, with the overall existing power, infra uh, power infrastructure. The one thing that customers are looking at, and it's becoming, I think, more of a trend now, is obviously the whole cold aisle serviceability. Um, so th the, the C5000 series um, was the first in the Power C line to do that, but we are actually seeing that trend happen with our other um, customers on other products. Um, so that's just one thing for our customers to think about um, in terms of, you know, their current infrastructure. And for a lot of our customers, that isn't a problem, but it is something to think about in terms of the whole um, infrastructure and setting up the C50 to 20 um, cabling and that aspect of it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I have a question for, for Naveen. Uh, you, you know, I thought that the, uh, the slide you had with the, uh, uh, with the, the, that sort of, placed all the workloads onto those three axes and, and showed, you know, where a lot of those workloads lay within the, uh, the sort of how Intel envisions the, the, the servers that address them. I, I'm curious to know, uh, I, I know you had specifically addressed, you know, like uh, scale out uh, low end web hosting applications and stuff like that. Is there a, a pretty, I know, I know obviously there are many, many types of web hosting environments, but uh, do you find that there's a pretty typical spread of uh, service provider workloads within that spectrum? Uh, if you're talking specifically about the hosting space, you know, there are different uh, hosting environments. Uh, you know, the microservers um, are increasingly playing role in the dedicated hosting space uh, where, you know, you are uh, giving out uh, a dedicated server to an end user and the end user might have different, you know, performance power needs. That's why, you know, we have uh, the Dell Viking platform supports multiple CPU option based on what customers want, right, in terms of, you know, performance or a certain SLA they might have. Uh, on the other end of the hosting space, you have shared hosting where you have, where you're virtualizing your servers and, you know, you are, uh, you know, sort of leasing out your virtual slices. So that's another way of, you know, looking at hosting your end users. Again, it all depends on what SLA requirements you want to drive as a hoster uh, for your end users and what the end user needs are. All right, thanks. So I think, I mean, there's a couple questions around here and I think that a lot of the, uh, Winston, what you were talking about uh, was a lot of sort of rubber meets the road stuff when it comes to the, you know, the 5220s. Uh, I guess, you know, you, you said you, you had chosen the C5220 uh, powered server for uh, the, the sort of cloud in a box solution that you guys were building. Um, can you talk a bit about, you know, what you would have been comparing it to, like the sort of decision making process that led you to that server and what the comparison you were making might have been? Well, yeah, and and, and the first thing that, that actually was, when, when we deployed this to actual service provider, what's interesting to me was the main benefit that they see in it is a lot less about the technology, a lot more about the analog, right? So a lot of service providers kind of grew from hosting to managed services, and they're very, very used to renting a server to a customer, right? What the microserver has done, actually, when it's deployed to them the first time around, when they see it visually, is it's actually easy for them to communicate that what they're going to be renting, uh, even if it's got the cloud software overlaid to it, is a dedicated server, right, in a very dense form factor. So. Uh, one aspect that a lot of this uh, the service provider has from a business standpoint is it's really easy to sell, right? You can articulate that I'm selling one slide at a time and it's a dedicated PC or a server. What's what's important and what the uh, the form factor of the 50 to 220 has done is to shrink that down to about uh, a four core uh, unit of measure because when companies are beginning to then start with that one sled and wants to grow granularly and atom atomically over time, being able to grow, you know, four cores at a time or, you know, four cores, 16 gigs of RAM at a time, granularity in a share nothing environment is really a, a unique value proposition. It makes the highly scalable share nothing private cloud uh, rent rental as a service, you know, very viable. And, and that's the reason why we selected this platform as the workhorse engine for, you know, for anything we deliver to a service provider. And it's proven to them that, A, it saves money because of the architecture is good, but it brings in new revenue to them. I guess th this is something that, that's kind of interesting. Can, can, can you talk about, uh, and, and maybe from a service provider standpoint, again, would be great, uh, it, it, 
h how saving money uh, is sort of connected to uh, generating revenue? Well, saving money is, is very clear uh, from this platform's perspective, right? So, you know, in, in the data center, the highest variable cost of any provider is power. And if you're able to reduce the power footprint, which, you know, the, uh, in our case, the C50 to 20 is able to do, that affects directly the bottom line in delivering the cost per VM per month for, for a hosting provider. And what we've seen so far is somewhere between 30 to 40 percent saving if you compare this to a typical 2U2 socket platform. So that's very directly affecting the bottom line. But the other aspect here is that um, by passing the savings to a customer, but, you know, making the sleds more granular, so I'm, I'm not buying 30 VMs at a time anymore, I'm buying 8 VMs at a time, uh, that helps the customer and saves them money in terms of not, not over-specking the platform that they're renting from a service provider. And that savings, while it translates to the customer, it also translates to the hosting provider as more margins. Because if a customer is using the infrastructure at a higher utilization, they'd be more willing to pay a higher per VM unit price. Okay. So let's talk about, um, you said, you, you, you sort of referenced the, you know, power consumption in the SSDs uh, in, in your last answer. but. Um, can you talk about just the extent to which uh, using SSDs reduce power consumption? Yeah, it's 10 to 1, right? So there's two things that SSD power consumption uh, brings to the table. First of all, because I have very high IOPS on SSD, I can eliminate an entire building block in the cloud chain, right? So I eliminate the SAN. So that's about 1,100 watts of a dedicated server that I can eliminate completely because I can run my VMs uh, on, the, on the SSD itself because I will have enough IOPS budget for it. And then secondly, um, once I've shrunk it down to form factor where I don't need a SAN, I'm replacing a spinning drive at about 10 to 15 watts to an SSD at, you know, 0.1 watt, right? So that, that in, that, that's the second level of, of power um, consumption savings and at you know, $220 per kilovolt hour, uh, kilovolt ampere uh, rates in a typical colo center, that translates to, you know, a lot of money saved. Uh, over time. So that's even significantly more than 50% savings and power alone relating to running high density virtual machines. Okay, is, is there a way for a service provider to sort of communicate those power benefits to customers or to, to, to make the customer feel like they're benefiting from those sort of power well, they savings? They, they can certainly, first they should communicate it because in general it saves power and it's green, right? It saves the planet. We're using 2% of our nation's energy in, in, in power. But secondarily, um, I think that that can reflect on the reduction of pricing that a service provider can offer to an end user of, what, of this architecture and then have more margin. So uh, the, the option to do either one is actually uh, put in the hands of the service provider. And I think what's great about the technology that uh, Dell and Intel is putting front to make this happen is that it, you know, in, in, in any case, it affects the bottom line of a service provider. Okay. Well, I think that's everything that we've planned to ask. I don't have any questions in from the uh, audience, which I tend to take as a sign that they're willing to wrap things up. Uh, uh, hopefully that is the case with our presenters. Um, I would like to thank everyone for, uh, for attending. I think that uh, we all really appreciate you turning out. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank Dina and Naveen and Winston for offering up some pretty great insight into some pretty exciting technology that can have a real impact in, you know, what, what hosting providers are doing and really, you know, be significant to their business. Um, uh, so thanks again to everyone, and uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, this will, uh, an archive of this webinar will be along, uh, alongside the uh, uh, past four webinars at thewar.com slash webinars. Uh, as of next week. So thanks again and uh, have a great day.